This is Duke University. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do um, today is November the 1st, 2017. Um, yesterday was Farrell March's birthday, so we're all going to wish him a belated <laughs> birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, Queens based and, and one of the few New York Met fans that I will ever see in the state of North Carolina, <laughs> or, or baseball fans for that matter. <laughs> um, how you doing today, man? Good, man. I feel blessed. Had a good birthday, and just for that, I feel good and I'm honored to be here in this forum, on this platform. So I feel really, really blessed. Your last album, Post Traumatic <clears throat> Stress Syndrome um, Disorder, mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about the inspiration for that. Well, we were uh, newly independent as a company, me and my manager, and we had just uh, the previous album did really well independently. It was mm -hmm. called War, acronym for We Are Renegades. And he was kind of uh, pressing me to put out some new material. And I thought, what, just, you know, text-wise, what a dope way to follow the War album with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but then when I started writing the project, I realized that uh, I needed to stay true mm. and not just use that as a, a term that was being used in the media, but really try to maybe address some personal issues because my work was giving life to inanimate objects and metaphoric. I wanted to be really introspective on the record, so um, I decided to go to a time where I was really struggling with depression and write about that uh, period for the album. There's very little space in our culture for people to have healthy conversations about mental health. <coughs> um, you mentioned the dynamics of it on, a tr on one of the tracks, Losing My Mind, that actually when these questions of mental health care come up in black families, the immediate response is kind of like, that's some white shit, <laughs> right? You know, the black folks don't, aren't supposed to go to therapy, right? Our, our choices tend to be, you find a therapist in the church with a minister. Um, and also in the context of you being an, uh, a black male, there's also very little space in the culture where we hear black men either A, seriously talk about mental health, um, or the kind of vulnerability that comes with it. Um, how difficult was it for you to be able to share? Um, you know, you mentioned you were introspective in this moment. How difficult was it for you to share these inner dynamics of your own struggles with depression and, and mental health care? Um, I mean, it was, it was difficult in the times. I was pulling from a period like maybe 10 years ago. <coughs> and luckily then, I was blessed to surround myself with really strong friends mm -hmm. that, that were the foundation of my childhood and family. So when, when I couldn't figure, figure out why I was struggling with certain issues, I kind of uh, immediately went to them. And their uh, suggestions weren't always good ones. Some people were like, smoke some weed, go to the club, do this, do that. And I'm, you know, I'm like, no, seriously, I'm, I'm really struggling right yeah, now. Yeah. And um, like I was saying to you, uh, I found out through going uh, to a certain doctor, dentist, that it was uh, because of a different cocktail of medications that I was taking for my asthma that had caused me to spiral but I couldn't figure out what was causing these emotions. And, um, you know, I just, in terms of writing it for the record, um, artistically and for myself, uh, I wanted to be true to what I was feeling so that uh, if anybody else was kind of struggling with those issues, they could relate to someone rapping about it. I don't want to lose that, that weed piece that, that elicited so much laughter a minute ago. Um, you know, you did this track with De La more than 15 years ago. Um, it was a little skit called Ghost Weed, right? And it was kind of making a joke that, you know, cats 
can't really do the kind of work that they think they need to be able to do on the mic unless they, they get lit up first. Right. Um, but, you know, we talked about this last night. When you see some of these, these documentaries, and I'm thinking about one in particular with Grandmaster Kaz, and Kaz was very open about the fact that, you know, he's dealing with all kinds of issues around anxiety, and, and the weed actually helps him with the anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. When you think about the connection between the use of, of weed, and, and let's just describe it for a moment as a performance enhancement drug amongst black professional athletes, right? Mm -hmm. How much of that actually has to do with some of the anxieties, performance anxieties associated with having to always produce in a culture that demands that black people produce a certain kind of way? Yeah, I think that, I mean, going back to the beginning of, of, of music, uh, people needed to break that uh, that pressure or anxiety mm -hmm. in terms of writing, and it's definitely used as a vice, you know, to, to get yourself over the hump or to break through in terms of weed, even studio, as well as live performance. But um, I like to, myself, know that I can um, achieve certain things in a, in a natural sense. As well, not that I haven't partaken in, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it, I don't like it as a crutch, you know. Right, so, when you listen to, and I don't know how much you listen to four four four, but Jay repeatedly talks about the impact that having a therapist, you know, has had on his life and whatever new space he headspace he's in mm -hmm. is is you know byproduct of that. Most cats don't don't have the money to afford um, therapy, right? You know, their, their self-medication is going to be the range of weed, alcohol, porn. I mean, we can name all kinds of things that cats self-medicate on. Um, is there a way for us to better intervene, right, in, in the quality of lives without this kind of self-medication, right? How, how do we get our communities obviously more interested in ways to do more holistic responses to their depression and their mental health issues. And also to take seriously the, the other thing about, about health care. Because, you know, we got cats who actually can afford right. a therapist who would never, right? Because that seems to be inconsistent with our ideas about who black men are, right? right. So even if they had access to this, right, they're still not going to go see a therapist or go to the doctor. It's definitely a, a matter of awareness and uh, uh some of the trauma that we grow up with naturally in, in the hood as black men is not natural. And we're not given the tools to cope with a lot of that emotionally. And I think it just builds layers upon layers. And you just, uh, you go along sometimes. And it's a matter of awareness and education and how to deal with you know, those fights differently than, than we normally would. My, uh, my production partner is also, went back to school, became a therapist, psychologist, and I talk to him all the time about, even years ago, how I would see signs of mental issues in music. I mean, artists, I just, I think, I don't want to turn crazy, but different by nature. Right. The fact that you even think that I'm gonna write this song, everyone in the world is gonna like this, this off kill from normal thinking. Right. <laughs> so I see in hip hop where uh, a lot of artists can benefit from having someone outside of their normal conversation to speak to uh, in a therapeutic way. Uh, and it's just, you know, I think it's becoming more open in hip hop with people like Jay Z and art. How have artists been with you in response to your revelations about your own struggles? <clears throat> um, I think my artist friends just like, musically, they're just like, is the shit good? Is it dope? Is it not? <laughs> I really love the album, it, it was inspiring. In spite of the fact that uh, this was your topic, it was still a good record that moved me and it was a, a step forward in growth as an artist. And in that itself, uh, 
Jerobi from Tribe is just like, I'm just blown away by uh, the effort you put forth on the record in terms of uh, the truth and exposing a lot of things like that. And that makes me think of going, you know, quickly in a, in a kind of side direction. Um, when, you, when you think about Fife, right, in his short lifespan, right, you think about Dilla, um, you know, cats who were dealing with um, chronic illnesses um, in a profession in which, you know, unlike professors at Duke, right, you know, you don't have a health care plan. Um, what are some of the difficulties of managing the reality of chronic disease, disease, you know, general mental health care issues um, within a, a, a capitalist system, in this case the music industry, that's not really concerned with those kinds of things, right, in terms of, of artists? The lifestyle just presents itself, and this is rock and whatever, it's right, just right. The, the alcohol is there and excess to, for you to have every night. The weed is there, the bad food, and you're, you're growing up culturally in a way that you're not transitioning into like proper adult behavior. You know, so you're still eating the way you were when you were 17, 18, right. and it catches up to you. So, you know, I think uh, there's been an effort to push uh, education and awareness and you know, and healthy eating and mental health of late. I've seen it, you know, more prevalent with artists like Cuddy and like myself and people just coming out being honest about it. You were diagnosed at a very young age um, mm -hmm. with, with asthma, right? So you've actually been living with a chronic illness your whole life. Um, at, what has it been like for you trying to navigate that? Um, just as a human being trying to, to live, but also in the context of a profession in which you absolutely need your ability to breathe, right? You know, even more than you know, <coughs> just trying to breathe and live. I mean, what you do on stage, you know, what you do in the studio is, is connected to your ability to be able to breathe freely. So, uh, you know, as I got into music, the irony is that the asthma became uh, the opponent and um, the reason to fight against uh, the illness verbally. So in listening to Coltrane and different um, musicians who did long runs singing or long runs playing uh, musically, it was a challenge for me to try to do that uh, as an MC. So I used it as a, as a fight, as an enemy, to try to propel myself to rap in a way that uh, wouldn't be expected of someone with asthma to rap. Yeah. So it became a gift and a curse. How much has the music itself, and, and not just hip hop, and not just your music, or the make, your making of the music, how much of that has served as therapy for you, both in terms of the, the asthma, <coughs> but also the mental health issues? It's, it's everything, you know, um, and it's a blessing I get to uh, get on stage and get out aggression and my social thoughts and get feedback from people. I get to get affirmation about what I was thinking in my art from people immediately. And unlike uh, different art forms, painters, actors, you're kind of waiting to get that affirmation. But with music and hip hop, it's almost an immediate response when you're on stage and you deliver a line and you get a ooh from the crowd. Or, so in that sense, it's, it's nothing like live performance. And so uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to have that. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have this line and still standing. Um, I feel like it's halftime, right? I'm gonna reach for the stars, right? <laughs> you have this moment where you get to reboot, and that could be a metaphor for your solo career, but obviously just in terms of, of the kinds of issues that, that you've helped, had to deal with as an artist and also as, a, as an African-American man. Um, how important has it been for you to be able to express that sense of resiliency in your music? It's important, it's important for me, it's important uh, to the culture, 
to know that um, even though I'm at this age and this point, there's still a lot more creativity and a lot more avenues in which your music can go and the way it's being disseminated and even in this form is what I meant by halftime back then. Um, I never looked at uh, the beginning of my career because of it started culturally and we were educated and uh, digging through James Brown records and such, we were already looking at it as um, something that I saw 20 years down the line because I was sampling from an artist that was 20 years my, my senior and it was still affecting me. So I'm thinking, man, if uh, you know Hendrix or James can make this music that still impacted my life 15 years later, that's what I want to do. So creatively, I think, the 90s cats were trying to make something that had a longer shelf life than we were being told to. You seem to suggest that <coughs> that spirit has been lost. <laughs> um, what would you attribute that to? I, I think in, in some of the artists uh, it has because uh, again the culture now is real immediate and you could gain success overnight by falling down the flight of stairs, making a meme, and it being on YouTube. A uh, mistake could get you fame. Right. Um, and the process is a shorter process in some cases uh, to get exposure. So I don't know if the, the thinking behind going into the creativity is long term, because the immediate impact is more prevalent now. So, uh, but there are still artists that are cut from that same cloth. You know, when you listen to <clears throat> J. Cole and Kendrick and such, and Ninth Wonder was playing us an artist, a new artist that he has that's like 16. And it's just, and no one taught him. He just studied. Right. He just sounds so wise and, you know, beyond his years. I don't know if it's something about cats that come from Queens, um, but when I look at your profile, when I look at Nas, obviously, um, you mentioned the immediacy of the culture now. Um, you don't seem to produce music based on that same immediacy, right? There, there's what we might deem as fairly traditional in the 80s, right? That kind of two or three year period between um, your recordings. Um, do you feel the pressure to, in the, at least in the, in the minds of the industry now, to be more consistent? Um, well, are you feeling more traditional artistic pressures that, that basically dictate that you're not gonna say what you need to say until you feel the need to say it? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's definitely about uh, the right time and representing honesty. And um, I, I think that's always cut through in hip hop from the most ignorant songs to the most provocative. Uh, when I feel someone's truth in their ignorance, I'm moved by that, um, if it feels honest. I don't like to, I think hip hop as a culture doesn't like to be tricked. So um, I just want to make sure that uh, whatever the artistic expression is, that is a, a honest interpretation of what I'm trying to do and has impact in in that sense, and time, you know, it's not really relevant because we jumped out of that when I went independent, you know, and to kind of compete with where radio is now, it's no sense in even trying to do that because I don't have the, the capital to, to play that game. Do you feel that there is a, a renewed energy in hip hop now um, given everything that we've witnessed, obviously, over the last five or six years, but particularly since last November, um, <laughs> do you feel as though there's a renewed energy within hip-hop among some artists around what's happening politically now? I think so. I mean, it's, it's you can feel it. And even when it's uh, not the straight up on politically or socially educated MCs, uh, 
making music about what's happening currently political, you can still feel the pressure of, of what's happening economically as well in the music, and that pushes it forward to be social, political. But um, I think you can't, you know, unless you're blind, you can't resist commenting on uh, a lot of what's happening right now because it's uh, impacting the neighborhoods and the culture and emotionally it's just impacting. Uh, a track like Stand Your Ground, um, which was written in part in response to Trayvon Martin, um, and the track Damages from, from PTSD, um, you mentioned Trayvon and also Ayanna Jones. Um, and then when we go back to the previous album, um, the track Clap, right, and you do the short film with Terrence Nance with Jabinga, um, amazing piece of, of kind of visual filmmaking. Um, folks have to be reminded that you did that before Trayvon is killed. Mm -hmm. We don't know who Tamir Rice is. Mm -hmm. We don't know who Sandra Bland is yet. Um, but you're telling a narrative that resonated with folks because that was our lives before we had handheld cameras to capture that. Um, did you feel as though you, you, what you were doing at that moment was prescient in a way, um, that you were trying to capture what was happening and actually push us to think more seriously about it? Definitely. The, the sad point, the sad part about that is <clears throat> manager I read a comment where a guy was saying that um, to do that type of music is redundant and clap was kind of a redundant song in hip-hop and my manager replied to him like this is always going to be right. right relevant music right. and it's sad to say that and um, just personally um, with Trayvon and uh, Sean Bell, it was just so crippling for me to kind of be asked by society to to uh, become desensitized in a way. It was happening so rapidly that uh, it wasn't that someone would say that to make a song like that is redundant, and uh, that's pain personal pain that I, I have to get out of my system every time and I have to speak on those those subjects, that subject matter. How did you come together with Pitch Black? Oh man, um, they have a festival in, in New York called the Static Festival and uh, Pitch Black is an amazing 11 piece brass band and they were making a, a lot of noise in the city <clears throat> and um, we thought it would be great to do a collaborative. Um, we did it at Lincoln Center. Um, most of the music was based around PTSD. Um, we got together, we had almost over 10 rehearsals for, yeah. you know, just, uh, for them to write the, the pieces, how it's constructed. It was pretty complicated. And uh, we added the string section as well. And, um, that's how we, you know, first did this, and when we did that show, it was so well received. We were like, we got to do this, you know, couple, at least a couple more times at other venues. The stuff that's so striking, one of the things that's so striking about your music is that, is that it is, in fact, so musical. Um, do you read music at all? Do you play music at all? <sighs> I play keys by ear. I just love music, and so to study it in that sense over the time period that I've been listening to music, you understand uh, song arrangement and you understand where bridges should be and go and where things should stop and how to articulate what your vision is yeah. musically. So um, although I, I stopped kind of actually making beats from organizing eternal affairs, I have been like executive producing music, so um, you know some of the pieces you played. I would get the production, then take it to the you know people I know who know how to play right, strings right, and right, right. produce around it. Uh, we joked about this um, 
because you sing, and, and, and you know, you don't sing like Drake. <laughs> you don't sing like Kanye. Um, you, you're more of like a Fonte <laughs> type singer. Like the singing is credible. Um, <laughs> not, not, not even. I, I try. <laughs> but, but talk about how important it is to integrate melody into what, because that's part of what you're doing with your singing voice. Right? It, it gives a depth of emotionality that being a lyricist can't necessarily get you to, right? at least in terms of sound. Um, but it also creates melody within the context of the music. So, so what are those moments where you're drawn to, I think I need to sing a hook here. <laughs> Growing up in a church and feeling uh, harmonies and harmonics, it affects you emotionally in a different way, just no notations mm -hmm. and melody. So again, from a very early perspective, I'm sitting there in church like, why is my hair standing up? And I'm getting goosebumps and analyzing exactly why that is. What note did she just hit? What did the pastor just say that was so truthful and honest to me that caused a physical reaction in my body? So even going into hip hop, it's like, I'm listening to songs uh, in terms of what melody would you write to evoke an emotion, what note, what tone strikes uh, an emotion in this record, rather than just what words. So, um, and that's pretty common. Um, I heard a, you know, Q-Tip and a couple of other artists, although you might not think that voice-wise with MCs, right. mm -hmm. they definitely think melody first and, and getting their message across. Give me three artists that the audience would be surprised that you listen to on a regular basis. Um, I'll just I'll just be honest. I listen to a lot of Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, yes, Pink Floyd. So it's like still seventies music and artists from that, that era of of music that made an impact socially on the on the culture back then. Uh, Hendrix and James and Stevie and Marvin and you know, people who were uh, just before their time and making really progressive music is what I stay listening to. You gotta tell me what it was like listening to Zeppelin and Deep Purple in the hood. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, mean I, I mean when you walking around Queens with, with your headphones on and it catches like what you listening to is like are are you readily handing them your headphones? Yeah, it was weird. I'm not gonna lie, it was weird. <laughs> it was weird, but it was natural for me because my 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 family had a gospel background. I have I'm the youngest in the family of, of four three siblings and my older brother was heavy into rock. And then my sister was listening to Prince and Michael Jackson in the next room. So I was getting all of these vibes. <clears throat> so it was natural for me to be like, I'm supposed to listen to everything, you know? I'm going to ask you one more before I open it up to the audience. Your top five. Probably changed from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> top five, ah, it's always hard. Um, I'll go three old school and say G-Rap, Rakim, and then Kane, and then I'll go Black Thought and Kendrick. Okay. We're going to take questions from the audience now. <laughs> well, I haven't done any actual uh, work in the community, physical work, but I'm looking forward to do it because I feel like time is the best thing you could give back as well. But it's, it is, it's very apparent, and um, it's very apparent that these kids are not given to t the tools to understand how to come up out of that and uh, emotionally cope with a lot of things that's happening every day and not just necessarily to them, to their friends or someone who you know, or just an individual away from these unfortunate circumstances. So. Um, it, there is 
an initiative that needs to be in place and I am looking forward to, you know, finding out for myself how to do it in my own community. Specifically, um, that album was both difficult and therapeutic in a sense that um, um, I don't deal with depression anymore. So I had to fall back into a time when I was struggling with it and immerse myself into it to ask myself, what does it feel like? What should the music feel like and the tempos feel like? So just revisiting that and uh, talking about it wasn't easy. But just like therapy, as I started to write it and see uh, it come to fruition, it brought forth a kind of like a cleansing and it was kind of therapeutic to get it out in this way musically and see it come to to form. So uh, at some points I was like, I don't know if I should touch on this specifically, these specific things. Uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it's been a, a, a beautiful thing because so many people do reach out to me, social media, in person, um, about how much the album has helped them. And in some cases, people have literally been like, listening to this record has saved my life. I've made different choices because um, of this record. And that in itself is just an unimaginable gift from uh, giving the music. That's the biggest, uh, you know, thing that I've gotten in return from putting that album out. Um, cause, because I'm an art student, um, I take the art seriously. I just love album covers. I love music, uh, collect albums. And so, you know, looking at the album covers of the artists I named previously, I'm inspired by that. But also as an artist, it's, it's important to make a visual connection as well. And uh, Matt Dew was the artist who actually hand painted the cover that he's talking about. It's like 40 by 30 actual piece that he painted and then we photographed to use for the, the artwork. Um, the irony in that is uh, he came to me and told me about his struggle with his uh, depression and he had very, very strict religious parents and I'm imagining that there were things he couldn't go to his parents about or whatever he was struggling with and um, I was able to, you know, have conversation with him about what happened to me and the choices that I made and um, unfortunately uh, he committed suicide like a year after the album came out. So um, this is a tragic story about a great piece of artwork and it has so many layers that you can still look at that piece today and, and discover things within the art. And uh, he was genius. I knew he was genius when, I, when he was creating the artwork because um, he was uh, pressing me to be more personable. Um, he wanted pictures of my father and he would come to my house and like look around to try and get the emotion of what uh, my life was like to put that into the, the, um, the album cover. So yeah, art is, is truly important to me. I mean, this is every day that is just what it is, you know, um, that it, it comes to face with me every day as a black man. It's just uh, become commonplace. As an artist, I get to remove myself and uh, immerse myself in what I want to create. And that's just the beauty of, of how I I'm blessed to, to do that, uh, or see art that way. So when I'm creating, I remove a lot of uh, the pressures and become free to create what I, whatever I want to create.
but the uh, I'm fortunate enough to 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 have gone to a point in my career where I don't have to deal with the duality of how I should create as a black man or whatever man or society or the industry. It's just all coming from, you know, where I see the art should go. So, but in everyday life, um, yeah, it's just you wake up and you deal with being black. No reprieve. I, I take it as an obligation, but I do understand that uh, uh, other artists who may be uh, more on more on hand in their community might choose to use their art for dance music or whatever, and I'm I'm open to that as well. As well as I've been very social, political in my music, but I'm you know. I couldn't be asked to speak on behalf of Colin Kaepernick, for for example. So you use what you have for me. It's uh, in the music and bringing the awareness the best way I know how now. So it feels natural to me. Uh, it does feel like a calling that I, I try to make change or leave something behind after I'm not here anymore that will still be impactful to people when they listen to it. I mean, the first thing I did um, was got my my medication correct for my for my asthma. You know, <clears throat> um, I was telling the the class yesterday um, how I found out is I was at a dentist appointment. Doctor brought me in uh, and was like, you know, write a list of the medications that you're on because we may need to blah 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 blah, and I just wrote them all out. Um, he brought me into his office privately and walked in and I'm like, this is weird. He sat me down and uh, I was fortunate that he was that good of a human being. And he just pointed out uh, through his knowledge, he asked me, do you know that these three medications combined can cause severe depression? And it was an awakening. I just started crying at his desk from understanding, one, what was happening to me. And so when I left the dentist, I called my pulmonary doctor and was like, what the fuck, he <laughs> had me on! What the fuck, What are you doing to me? <laughs> and um, he was like, stop, stop, stop taking I'm like, I didn't, you know, I don't know. But this had lasted for like, uh, at least six months with me having uh, these type of thoughts, and I'm just like not under, um, you know. So I put two and two together, and then um, I started taking care of myself better and working out and eating right and being around positive energy, all those things. But I think. You know, any of us could get diagnosed with something today. I hate being late. So if I'm in the car and I see I'm not going to be on time, I get like super anxiety. I'm never late. I hate being late. I don't know what that's about. I know that's the antithesis of rap music, but I hate being late. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I just, I just try to find uh, things that are pleasing to me and stay in those moments. And as far as the theme music, walking into the club, right now will probably be some silly thing like Shaft or some shit like that. I don't know. <laughs> it's been a, a point of contention and conversation pretty far back in, in my life. And so, to be quite honest, over the course of, of time, I, my thoughts have changed and kind of dissolved. And uh, personally, I've moved forward without even 
you know, given it that much thought personally and on a, on a wide basis, I've been like, uh, I guess my mentality has been like, let's forge forward and, and you know, it's not a point, you know, hasn't been a topic amongst my group of friends like it used to be. The music still needs to be jamming and it needs to be entertaining and it needs to be good. And that's the tricky part. How do you get the info without going over people's heads and still have it jamming? And um, at this point, again, for me, um, it's probably a little unapologetically highbrow. And uh, I don't care if you get it or not. Um, it's specifically for the people in the frequency that I think um, could get the message and then spread it out to somebody else. And I've been like, I know that there's a connectiveness between people and frequency. So I've been staying in that zone and trying to work with that communication. I mean, <clears throat> for me, is. It's important to, this is all interconnected. Those issues are interconnected. The reason why these kids are making the choices that they're making and the systematic, it's all interconnected. So for me, um, making the choice to make a record like I did and, and my management knew beforehand that it would push me into this forum into this platform to to have these type of conversations to talk about how to integrate and and make that move because it's not prevalent so i think uh again not to sound cheesy the music that i make is creating this platform to have these conversations for me to think about how i could implement uh what you're just saying in my immediate neighborhood if I can, I know I just saw a comment do a whole tour in, uh, for the incarcerated. So the work is being done, or we're trying, you know what I mean? So it's not void of, you know, we understand what's happening, it's just how to attack it, how to execute is the conversation that needs to be had. And, you know, having these conversations bring about what you just said, it makes me aware. And now maybe we could uh, discuss how to implement these things. Yeah, those artists are misguided themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. I mean, I mean, do I have to? Uh, I mean, the, the the desire for, for uh, that lifestyle in itself is kind of defeating uh, for so many different different ways. And you, I, I wish well for all artists and try to find art in everybody's creation. I hope that if you are just monetarily successful, that you find a way to um, give back in some way as well. You know, that's my hope when I see people who are uh, maybe missing the point, but financially, uh, you know, successful. I hope they give back in that way somehow. I've been fortunate enough, you know, very early on that um, my group was very well received overseas, and um, we, man, we traveled. I've been everywhere in the world. And so um, just that experience alone taught me that how alike people are and different, which showed me how to write in different ways, as well as, uh, you know, just life experiences. Love lost, love gained, and uh, the intricacies of, of what that really feels like. And, uh, you know, just writing about that and it, you know, living life gives you wisdom to write. So I welcome it, you know, I welcome people hearing, you know, the wisdom that I've gained. So uh, 
being an older artist is it feels great actually. <laughs> That, that, by the way, is his tour manager. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're always on my back because it takes me a long time. But I mean, um, I tour a lot, so uh, income-wise, I'm, I'm blessed to do that, and that that's fun as well. But uh, a lot of artists today, since records aren't selling, make their living on the road and um, doing shows, which takes me away from the studio. And this current album is like with the band, so it's a different process. Still samples, but um, it's like uh, more intricate in the process and getting people's time and creating it. So it's taken me, I thought it would be faster than usual, but it's still taking me some time to make Mr. Manager Man. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you mentioned last night. You mentioned last night that for the new album, there's there's one artist that you really want to get, um, and you don't know what that you're gonna be able to. You want to tell them what that who that artist is? Since I'm a, a Zeppelin fan, and I've always been a fan of uh, Robert Plant's vocals, and that the the new album is very very hardcore, and a and a soulful Zeppelin way and I was told that he's a, he's a fan of hip hop and he has a new album out so I'm gonna try you know you can't hurt but, but can't hurt to ask you know but it's so, it would be uh, so fitting uh, to the music uh, the album is really black and his vocal is just uh, such in a register and so soulful that I think it would cut through in it. If I did the song with Plan, I would just quit after that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it, you know. Thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you to Carl Mark. <laughs>